Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. Do you ever feel there's greatness inside of you, a higher purpose or calling, something grander or more meant for your life? If you only you could figure out what it is or how in the world to tap into it, if so, then do we have the show for you. Today, we'll be talking with Derek Rydell, prominent life coach to Emmy and Academy Award winners, Fortune 500 execs, and evolutionary leaders in business, spirituality, and the healing arts. And he's the best-selling author of several books, including Emergence, Seven Steps for Radical Life Change. I must say, Emergence is one of the most radical books on life change I've read, and I mean that in a great way. For Derek Rydell empowers you to be your most amazing self, one more grand than you could have possibly imagined. So today we'll talk about Emergence 101, about understanding who we truly are, how to discover our gifts, and how to grow from a tiny, humble acorn to the magnificent oak we were each meant to be. Well, welcome to the show, Derek. Are you ready to shine? I am ready, man. I'm going to shine so bright, you guys are going to have to wear sunglasses. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> well, bring on those shades. That's right. So before we get into things, I I've got to ask... Did you really crack while giving a self-help talk? Oh, yeah. You mean the, the breakthrough? I talk about that in my book where I was giving yet another one of those self-improvement talks, you know, and it sounded great and it hit all the, 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 the notes and dotted all the, the I's and crossed all the T's. But it was the and usually I was able to rev people up. And this time there was just like it was a big disconnect. Mm -hmm. and, and as I was standing up there speaking to them it was just like this the energy i could see them looking kind of tired kind of worn out and all of a sudden i felt this like nervousness in me almost like a panic attack yeah like this isn't working something's broken something you know danger will rogers <laughs> danger and um and and all of a sudden in, in this moment of panic like my heart started racing and there was no control, and I, I'd, already, I'd been in that kind of situation when I almost died before, and, and I just took a breath and just mm -hmm. surrendered, and all of a sudden, I became aware that self-improvement was an oxymoron, that, that you can't, the words became clear, that mm -hmm. the, the insight I'd had before of almost dying, it was like, it suddenly crystallized into words, and I could see that the self was already perfect, and I knew that by then. So all this talk about trying to improve it and push people to grow and change and heal and fix was wrong and was actually creating more suffering and get, bringing us further away from who we really are. Th and this I is a lot of an internal conversation to have <laughs> as you're there blank like, stares. It, it, it was a quick, it wasn't like I was sitting there for like, you know, three minutes, but it was an awareness, like all the pieces that had been coming together suddenly snapped into relief mm -hmm. and I could see that. And I took a breath and I said, and I just changed my whole tact. And I said, you know, this is the end of self-improvement. And they, there was like this collective sigh, like, oh, thank God. <laughs> God you know, we don't have to keep improving ourselves. It's like I could see how beaten down they were. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was when that sort of crystallized for me. And so what gelled at that point? Because you're saying well, yeah. it's the end of self-improvement. What does that mean? Yeah, well, you know, if you if you know my story, and I yep. haven't told my whole story here, but like so many people, I was struggling for years, decades, really, to improve my life, mm -hmm. to get over my bad childhood, to heal my broken heart, to make more money, to not feel whatever. And and rather than improve, the only thing I really improved after a decade of self-improvement therapy and all of that was my ability to describe why my life was so screwed up. You know, I got very improved in my abilities <laughs> in that. But it eventually you, you it, even start you have a story right in the beginning of this where where you are on the verge of no longer even being here in the midst of all of your self improvement. Well, I I was suicidal at one point. I got so frustrated and felt so broken down by trying to improve my life that I became addicted to drugs and alcohol, and was I couldn't drive across a bridge without wanting to drive off of it. I literally remember one time driving across a bridge mm -hmm. and I had to hold the wheel like to make sure, almost like like liar liar where he, you know, you're not in control of your own body and it's just yeah. like, Ugh. and I had to literally hold the wheel and keep my head forward because if I didn't, I was going off. And, uh, and I had a near death experience when I got caught in a coral reef where I was, I was convinced I was going to drown. I couldn't get out, nobody knew I was out there. 
And after a long ordeal, I realized I was going to drown. And all that was left for me was to surrender. And in a moment of surrender, that was the beginning of the cracking open of this acorn shell. I saw that the self I'd been trying to improve all this time was a fiction. It was a figment of my imagination, a collection of peer pressure, parental fantasy, societal conditioning. And I saw right behind it was the real self, a perfect pattern, a, a perfect idea, a divine design, if you will. And it didn't need to be improved because it was already complete. And it didn't need to be fixed because it wasn't broken. And, <laughs> yes, yes. And it radically shifted. And in that same moment, this water came along. I don't know how I got out of that coral reef, this pocket. Can, can I was you trapped. describe it? Because you describe it in the book, and it's, it's intense. It was intense, man. I was, I was doing a movie, and uh, I was an actor at the time, and I'd, the movie was falling apart. Another romance fell apart on the set, you know, and I, was, I went out diving alone in a reef, first mm -hmm. mistake, and I was kind of reckless. And I prayed to get lost from everything above. You know, and you got to be careful what you pray for. <laughs> I, Law of I Attraction pray. 101. <laughs> I, I answered, man, and I, before I knew it, following some brightly colored fish, I was stuck in a pocket of giant spiked coral that was literally like an underwater booby trap tomb out of Indiana Jones. And I was, it was inches from my neck, my throat, my face, my stomach, my chest, literally this close. And the walls were covered in packed fire coral that if I was to touch it, it was like a thousand jellyfish stings. And, and it was a compact little, little spot. I couldn't breathe deeply because if I breathed deeply, I would be skewered by these giant spikes, rows of spikes. I couldn't swim down to see how to get out because it was covered in spikes. I couldn't lift my head out of the water because my chest or stomach would have been punctured and skewered by these giant spikes. And I was just stuck swimming with my fingers to stay afloat at oh that level because God. if I swam deeper, I would have been skewered. I was breathing <laughs> short staccato breaths because I couldn't take a deep breath. And my mind started going through all these, how is I'm, who's going to save me? How am I going to get saved? And at some point I realized nobody was coming to save me. And I realized that all of my wit and charm and affirmations wasn't going to get me out of this. Mm -hmm. And the curtain was pulled back on the wonderful wizard of me and revealed to be this scared little boy that had no control whatsoever. And, and I finally got to the moment where my ego had gone through all the scenarios. I even had a moment where I was imagining, well, at least if I die, I'll, you know, they'll put me on the cover of the Hollywood reporter and, you know, I'll get a moment of <laughs> man, he goes really having fun. <laughs> oh yeah. It's still I'm my last gasp of breath and it's looking for its 15 minutes still. And finally the, the, the tape got to the end of the reel, you know, like one of those old reel to reel machines. Flap, 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 it's flap, like flap. Chi, 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 chi. And I realized not that I was afraid of drowning, not that I might drown, but that I was going to. And I get chills every time I say that because um, it was a level of finality that you can't understand intellectually, mm -hmm. but I think your people can feel it. And I realized I was going to die. And there was nothing left for me to do but to surrender. And it wasn't one of those, God, please, if you get me out of this, I'll go to church on Sunday kind of things. I'd already tried, tried that. The universe <laughs> wasn't, wasn't no bargaining, no bargaining. Mm -hmm. It was a total and complete unconditional surrender to my highest idea of the universe, God, whatever. And in that moment of surrender, in that very moment, that ego was just ripped from its mooring. Something cracked open. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. And at the same moment, this wave came along, or I literally walked on water. I still don't know. But in the next instant, I was standing outside of this pocket. And I could look down and see that I, the exit had been inches from me the whole time. Always and <laughs> I could see that, and I could see that this this labyrinth of coral was like a maze, like it represented my life. I'd been swimming through this maze, following brightly colored things, and I was stuck. I was drowning. I was gasping for air. That was my life. But in that moment, it became real. And in that moment of true surrender, that identity just split. And I could see, as I said before, that. There was a me behind that that was already whole, already complete, already never been damaged or diminished by, the, by his life and just was waiting for me to see him and to call him forth. 
And the man that swam out of that coral reef was not the young boy that swam into it. And, um, and, and from that po point forward for the next year, I began letting go of everything in my life. I was going to become a monk. And uh, I went to a monastery to fast. And several days into it, I got so hungry and so freaked out by the whole thing that I broke into the monk's kitchen in the middle of the night and stole food out of their freezer refrigerator. Oh, that, um, and that I realized that one. <laughs> maybe the monk life isn't quite right for me. Um, but yeah, so that's ultimately what eventually I cloistered myself in my apartment and I began to go on this deep inward journey to understand what happened. What, what did I touch? What's, what was that glimpse? And, and, and I began to understand that the whole model of self-improvement was really backwards and was in fact creating more violence and more pain for so many people, myself especially, because we're trying to improve something mm -hmm. that we're, th this, the part of us that's trying to do all the improving is a false concept. And it's actually creating all of the resistance, blocking the part of us that's trying to naturally unfold and emerge. So rather than, rather than saying we're broken, which inherently means we're focused on being broken, yeah. it's, it's dusting off what's already there. Well, it's interesting you say dusting off, and I haven't used this analogy for a long time, but you know, back when I think during the, when the Tibetans were being raided by the Chinese in the very early beginning of that, might have even been a different war, mm -hmm. um, they had all these, they, had, they, they were you know, getting rid of all their stuff and they were getting robbed. And many, many years later, there was a, 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 a temple left and there was this big giant clay Buddha. And one night during a heavy rainstorm, the, one of the monks saw this glint of light come from this giant clay Buddha. And he went out to it and he played with it a little bit and the clay fell off. That's and it was hiding. solid gold. And I get chills. <gasps> Ooh, and just, yeah, I got them too. <laughs> double goose god bumps on top of it. And, and all the clay fell off. It was this giant solid gold Buddha. And what had happened is during the war when they were being pillaged and robbed and destroyed, and, and they were destroying all these Buddhas and melting them down and selling them off to pay for their war, um, somebody had covered it up with clay to protect it. And so in a very real way, What's happened over our life is that we've been covered up. We've covered ourselves up with all of these protective, all of this protective clay so that we can't get, the world can't get to and damage and destroy the solid gold center of our being. And, and that's a magnificent metaphor. And so what, what, what happens is all of our coping mechanisms to mm -hmm. survive and get by and, and to be the person we think will get the love and acceptance, that creates this false self-concept that believes he or she is broken, damaged, lacking, something's missing, something's wrong. And then now if I can just do more, be more, get more, or get rid of some bad parts of me. Or work I'll harder. Or work, yeah, work harder, work smarter, work faster. I'll finally be enough to be lovable and worthy and valuable and to, to relax and enjoy life. Um, the problem is it's a complete false self-concept. It's a complete false premise. Mm -hmm that we're already the golden Buddha. We're <laughs> already the, the Tao, the light of the world, perfect, whole, and complete, unique expressions of infinite beauty and power and abundance. And so when we're trying to do all these techniques, like law of attraction or personal development, self-improvement rather, we're often trying to attract and improve and achieve from a concept that we're broken, damaged, limiting, and lacking. And so most of our efforts actually create a barrier and a resistance to the very thing that is trying to naturally emerge. So in a sense, the law of attraction, because we have such a, a small concept, we're stuck with this concept, it's a one foot in, one foot out, or one foot in universe, one foot in ego, and you just, you, you got one foot on the brake and the gas. No, oh, man, it's like the Zen statement, you're trying to ride two horses <laughs> going in opposite directions at the same time. It's going to be pretty painful. Yeah. Or as the Bible says, you're, you're serving two masters and you have a house that is divided and a house divided cannot stand. There's no structural integrity. And, and that's what I find with so many people is not only that, if you manage to, ma to manifest, to will yourself into a bigger paycheck from that place, you often end up just broke at a higher income bracket. Mm -hmm. And if you manifest a bigger house, you end up just being even less at home. Well, it's kind of jumping ahead, but I love the section where you were talking about law of attraction and the visualization manifestation cycle 
because yeah. it's it's hey this guy did his homework <laughs> it's an awesome awesome book and i will recommend everybody to go out and get it because it it doesn't treat you as broken it treats you as whole and complete but it also gives you homework to get there so when we're talking about law of attraction we're talking about you use the analogy of the acorn so maybe i should have you jump in with the acorn before i go and and spoil the whole story here sure sure <laughs> You just made me have a little clever little play on words. You said homework and that we're whole and complete. It's homework. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, so the, the basic discovery that I had when I, when I cloistered myself and realized that this part of me that was already perfect, that was the, I, the analogy of the oak tree, and really any seed will do, but that the oak is already in the acorn. The o- acorn doesn't go out and attract an oak. It doesn't achieve an oak. It doesn't have to become worthy to be an oak. It doesn't go collect oak parts and pieces and all that. It doesn't even have to even go to school to learn how to be an oak. The oak is already intrinsic to it. It's already what it is. Mm-hmm. And in, meta- in quantum physics, we even know that the oak is there vibrationally. It's there completely. It's there in its fullness. It's just not manifest. And so just like a radio station, you know, your favorite music is playing on a certain station right now, but it's not manifest until your tuner is aligned with the tuning of the station that the music is playing. And when that happens, the music becomes, that station becomes manifest. In other words, you have a manifest station. And so that music wasn't in the distance, it wasn't in the future, it was broadcasting right where you are, but it was invisible and intangible until your frequency matched that frequency. And suddenly that which was invisibly broadcasting become manifest. So this oak is there already. And when the acorn surrenders to the soil and the conditions in the acorn's environment match the pattern in the seed, Mm -hmm. then that which is inherent naturally emerges. And this is true with all seeds. When the conditions match the pattern in the seed, that potential naturally emerges. And we even know that it's not taking anything away from the soil. So it's not, it's really all there in the frequency of the seed. They've measured like a bathtub put a tree in there, you know, put a seed, put the soil, grow it, and then the tree grows and it gives fruit and all that, and they take it out, measure it, same amount of dirt, same weight, same volume. Um, so it's all there. It's all in you. And so I realized that, 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 it's, that we operate the same way as nature, that there's a seed of infinite potential planted in the soil of our own soul or our own mind. And when we create the right conditions, it naturally emerges. And one little thing I'll say before we jump to the next thing is a seed is indigenous. That means that its ability to create the right conditions is externally derived. So it doesn't have power to determine that. It's a seed upon the wind. And if the conditions are right, awesome. If they're not, could be problems. It's indigenous. It has to be in the right external environment. We are endogenous which means that we carry our weather system with us. Mm -hmm. So no matter how many clouds are outside, we can shine the light within ourselves. No matter what, how rocky the soil of our soul is, we can cultivate it to be ripe for the harvest. No matter where we've been planted outside, we're always planted inside. So we have that immense power to create the right conditions no matter what our external situation is. So I've got to ask then, jumping back to your story. You're out of the coral, and even later on, you're giving a talk. How did you connect the dots yourself, or what did you start doing yourself to get yourself in vibrational alignment to turn your acorn into an oak tree? Well, the first biggest thing, obviously, is the realization of the truth, <clears throat> is that the, the, you know, we all have to have a moment where we suddenly see differently, mm-hmm. where we actually get like if you're listening right now and this is resonating, it means you're ready to get this truth. You know, there's a saying, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. The truth doesn't just make you free. You got to know it. Electricity is all around us, but we got to be plugged into it mm-hmm. to, to turn on our appliances. So I'm telling you the truth right now. And the truth is that you are already it. You're already whole and complete. Nothing is broken. Nothing is lacking. Nothing is missing. You can't add anything to you, and nobody can ever take anything away. I'll, I'll you pause brought- you there. That yeah. means you are all rock stars. <laughs> and you are all rock stars. And I really mean it. This is not, and, this, and, I, and I, what's important and what's happening right now, if you guys are open, is a transmission. Mm-hmm. Beyond the words, 
because I'm not speaking affirmations. I'm not speaking theory. I'm the, the, the vibration that's being emitted is the truth. And if you're willing to be, it's not woo woo, it's quantum physics. If you're willing to be receptive, then you can actually receive the shift. And so you already are it. This is not just a nice, pleasant concept or wishful thinking. And so the knowing of it, my ability to see that I'm not this damaged, broken person, that I'm actually this perfect, whole, complete expression of life. Um, that was the beginning point. That really, that's like a reframing. Mm -hmm. And then, and then once you know the truth, even if you haven't like completely been enlightened, and I wasn't, and I'm not, but it was enough of a glimpse. Now you have to design your life in a way that is congruent with the truth, as the old saying goes: God suffers a stillbirth. Every time you do not act by the truth you know. And so the, the higher potential in you suffers a stillbirth every time you get a chance to act in integrity with the truth you know, but you don't. And so now that you guys have heard this, and some of you are really feeling it, and you've heard a lot more truth with Michael on these episodes, now the key is, are you designing a way of life? So that your conversations, your actions, your friendships, your, your environment is becoming increasingly congruent with what's true about you. So that you're surrounded by the people, places, things inside and out that represent who you really are and where you're going, not where you've been. So that's the next big piece for me is I had to begin to redesign my life. Yep. And I did it big time. Where'd that start? So it started by me um, pretty radically going okay, all of the TV and the magazines and the music and the, the books and all the things that weren't congruent, that were just full of violence and degradation and hype and it just wasn't congruent with the, the, the purity and the harmony and the love and the peace, that had to all go. Um, so I ended up getting rid of all of that. I bet um, you felt better. You know, for, at first I kind of went through some withdrawals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like getting off a of heroin for a lot of us. Um, and, uh, and then little bit by little bit, as that was out of my environment mm -hmm. and I got to the detox, the level of peace that came over me, I remember I had a neighbor that would come over and he would be like talking to me for a few minutes and be like, ah, oh, man, you know, when I'm around you, I just suddenly feel the weight of the world fall off my shoulders and I'm so at peace. <laughs> yeah. So, cause I wasn't this, this field of all this debris, you know, that we're walking around in. And then what began to happen is gifts and talents that I didn't even know would ever be possible, but had always wanted to be started to blossom. Like I began to be able to sing and play piano and do music, you know, and before I would sing and people's ears would bleed. And <laughs> now, you know, dogs, you know, wouldn't even howl. They would just cry and hide under a rock, you know. Yep. And now all this was coming through, all these talents, all this insight in that more purified field more of the real me was now able to start to grow and emerge. So I, began, so I began to get rid of things. The second thing was, and that included, by the way, and this is a tough one, some of my friendships and family relationships, mm -hmm. I didn't get rid of my family, but I definitely limited contact with the family members that just couldn't support me where I was going. I spoke with uh, Jen Sincero. Um, it's, uh, oh, here we are. You are a badass. And I spoke with her earlier this week, and she was talking about the crab effect. That mm, uh, if yes. you put a bunch of crabs in the bowl, yes, instead yes. of people supporting you, pushing you yeah. up, the crabs keep, and, and that can be your, your support, it quote is. unquote, support network. It is, unfortunately, yeah. It's, it's, it's the way the ego works, too. The ego is designed to keep us the same, but to convince us we're changing, mm -hmm. or to convince us that we can't. It's an artifact of our evolutionary growth, where if we were to change too fast, the tribe would have never become sustainable and we would have gone into places where there were enemies and animals and weather and no food. And so evolutionarily speaking, we have this artifact in our ego that prevents change, mm -hmm. that helped us survive and now is putting us on the brink of extinction. <laughs> um, and um, it's not letting us evolve. And the same thing happens in our tribes called our families. And um, they don't mean, so, and for the most part, they, they don't mean it ill will. Um, it's it's just this this protective device, and um, so yeah, so you got You have to separate yourself from that until you're strong enough 
and more and integrated enough in this next level of your vision so that you can hold your space in that expanded place. Then you can go back into those relationships and now you are a leavening influence. You are an uplifting influence. And in fact, many of my family members that thought I had, you know, gotten a lobotomy, freaked out on Jesus, <laughs> you know, whatever, um, joined a cult, uh, they all have now found their own path and their whole, their life has been taken to a new level. So, um, well, you're being the light. Exactly. And um, it, it wasn't easy. You know, the fine print here is that the, the, the way is narrow and the path is straight and few there be that follow it. Everybody's called, but few choose to answer the call. Most people let it go to voicemail. And uh, the universe gets the message mailbox full. <laughs> so if you're you know, listening to this show, don't let it go to voicemail. <laughs> voicemail, man. You know, um, like like you're getting called. If you're listening right now, it's not an accident. You know, you're being called. And 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 then so you have to start. You know, you don't have to be as radical as I was, but little bit by little bit, you have to start looking at your life and your conversations and the things you put into your mind and your body and the things that come out of your mouth and and the people you're with, and you ask, is this congruent with the life that I want mm -hmm. and with the vision that's unfolding? Am I investing and, and building an environment that is um, you know, a match for this, this, the life of wealth, abundance, success, health, joy, love, you know, or are my conversations and company commiserating around how bad it is, how bad I am, how bad they are, the, you know, what's not possible, how it's so impossible. You got to look at it honestly. And you know the old thing, you, you tend to, um, your earnings tend to be the, the, the average of the five people you hang around with. Well, it's not just your earnings, it's everything. And, and it's not just the people you hang around with in person, it's the videos you watch, it's the audios you listen to, it's the movies and TV and music and books. It's, it's all of that. You I know, it's the news. Us, I, I think of us as, as a computer and that's all the software. So that's telling the computer what to run is every input. You were just going to news. Talk about starting your day, listening to this shooting, that shooting, the other thing, the stock market's on edge. And how in the world are you supposed to be empowered for that day? Yeah, you should just get up in the morning, save on the electri electricity bill for the news. Just get up in the morning, look in the mirror, slap yourself a couple <laughs> times, hit your fingers with a hammer, oh, drop no. something on no, your No, no, no. <laughs> Drink some poison and look in the mirror and say, you suck. And then go to, <laughs> you'll actually probably be better off than if you filled your head with all the news. You know? let, let, let me give you an alternative. Yeah. Go outside and listen to the birds singing. They Absolutely. haven't checked out the news. <laughs> Episode of Inspire, you know, watch Inspire Nation with Mike. <laughs> Seriously, you know, and, and, and begin to do that, you know, Create a ritual, again, that matches the person you want to be. Don't wait for conditions to change. That's another big key. Mm -hmm. Because from the emergence model, whatever's missing is what you're not giving. From the emergence Let model... Let me slow you down there. Can, yeah. you, can you say that again more slowly and, and explain that? Yes. Whatever. <laughs> uh, whatever's missing is what you're not giving. Because the truth is that everything really truly is within you. You're a divine power plant. Mm -hmm. And a power plant doesn't receive the energy, it generates it. So when you walk into a room or into a relationship or show up at a job, the only thing you can ever meet is what you are bringing and what you brought up to that moment. And it's a principle. So, so whatever's missing, the love, the joy, the peace, that's because you're not bringing it. Now, there's no judgment here. Mm -hmm. That's not, I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm just saying if you want more of that, you got to bring it. If you want more to come into your life, you have to let more life come out of you. If you want something different to come into your life, you have to let something different come out of you. And so, because it's all in you, you're the answer you've been waiting for and the answer that many people have been waiting for. It's, the, so, it's so the opposite of what we were ch taught as it's children. It's exactly the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. Um, you know how the old thing when you were children, like, you know, one of those Alice in Wonderland type of books and you have like opposite day? Um, well, we're living, we've been living an opposite day. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about how when we're feeling in love and enlightened, it's like an altered state. That's not the altered state. That's the normal state. 
Everything else is the altered state. So you are, you know, you, in fact, the word human comes from a Sanskrit term for man Mm -hmm. that means the dispenser of divine gifts. So, so you, you know, a lot of people are like looking at problems in the world or wherever and saying, God, why don't you do something? And God's like, why do you think I put you there? (laughs) <laughs> and it, when I use the word God, I'm not talking about an anthropomorphic guy with a beard on a mm-hmm. cloud. I'm talking about this universal intelligence, presence, love, life, whatever you want to call it. But it sent you. And also it's important to know that you're not on your way to God or to heaven or to wholeness any more than a sunbeam is on its way to the sun. You are coming from it. You are a radiant expression of it. You are it. You are the way love and abundance and life and power and brilliance is expressing. And so whenever you're looking at the world and seeing darkness, you're there to be the light. You're there to be the love. You're there to show up and bring the joy and the validation. And if it's missing, it's not coming to you, you have to start with yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to start going, if if you're waiting for somebody else to love you, validate you, approve of you, appreciate you, you're wait, you know, whatever you're waiting for, you're waiting with, and you're off, off, often weighing it down. And so emergence is the ultimate weight loss program. It's, it's about you realizing, okay, I want more love, validation, appreciation. What would it look like if I loved, validated, and appreciated myself more? How would I show up? What would I do then? And if you start acting that way, you will activate those qualities within you. You will turn on the divine power plant and you will start shining, let me tell you. It, it's as if you have to be in love with yourself. <laughs> it's not even as if, it's a prerequisite. It's <laughs> necessary because people will treat you mm-hmm. the way you train them mm-hmm. based on how you treat yourself. So how you treat yourself and how you hold yourself is how life will treat and hold you. It's all a mirror. So let's dive into then the, the principle of emergence or the law of emergence and, and some early steps people can take here to get going on this process. Absolutely. And just understand, folks, that what we're talking about now is crucial foundational frame, reframing. That, that if, you, if you're starting to grok what we're saying and feel the resonance and the vibration, you're starting to reframe the way you see your life and see yourself in life. That you're not a victim. Life isn't happening to you. Life is happening through you and as you. And for as, you. <laughs> for you. Thank you. So that's a very big shift. When you really get that life's happening through you and as you and that everything is for you, that talk about a reframing. So that's the starting point. This is not really tangential. Mm-hmm. Then the first stage of what I call emergeneering which is about engineering the emergence of your life or any aspect of it, because you can use the template for your business, for your relationships, for your money, for your body, but the general template. The first stage is seeing the completed vision or just vision. And so this is about beginning to tap into, there is a seed of perfection and of infinite potential and of genius in you, as there is in every business or project that you are inspired to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not about, you know, your vision is not something you just make up. It's what you're made of. And if you're not tapped into that seed idea and aligning yourself with it, you're not tapped into your true power. And a lot of the problems you experience in your life are often a symptom of you not being rooted in your deepest vision. I know a lot of people and I can, I can hear people listening to this going, you know, this makes sense up to this point. But I have tried like the Dickens to yeah. figure out, and, and yeah. it drives me nuts. It's almost, a, it, yeah. not almost, it is a self-worth issue when we can't figure out what our vision is. We're going, something's wrong. Am I broken? Yeah. Am I off track? What do I yes. do? It is one of the biggest challenges I find, too, is people getting clarity. Now, we don't maybe have the scope of getting into why that really happens because there's what I call, there's eight vision blinders mm-hmm. and um, in my soul purpose blueprint work, which is part of the emergence fra- you know, suite of programs. Um, there's, there's, there's core reasons why we're not able to really see our vision that is beyond just what you might think. Why you don't, when you, because the vision's there, it wants you to see it. it. It's screaming out to you all over the place. But there's some reasons why you filter it out. 
because it will mean you'll actually have to change, you'll actually have to grow, you'll actually have to step out of your comfort zone, you'll actually have to be seen, all these reasons. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in general, there's, there's a couple ways, and I'll just do a little fun little exercise with you guys right now to help you to begin to see what is trying to emerge in you, what is that vision that's speaking to you. It's a thing I call the soul profile. Basically, just for right now, take a moment and just think about you know three or four people in the world either living or no longer with us, in any area of life that you just think are just amazing. Like you're, they're so inspiring. You so aspire to know them, be like them. Um, you know, from Oprah to Jesus to Buddha to Shakespeare to Spielberg to Obama to whoever, you know, Richard Branson, whatever is your person or people. Or it could be your Uncle Joe or the neighbor down the street. Um, but they're people that you just think are phenomenal. It could be artists, authors, teachers, coaches. And just write them down real quick. Don't overthink it. You're looking for those people that really push you, that really pull you. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you need to, afterwards, you can always put in the replay of this. I'm sure you'll provide that. You can pause it and take more time with this. Second, I want you to write down, if you're driving, just think it. What is it about them that you love so much? What are the qualities about them? You know, they're so articulate. They're so inspiring. They're so loving, compassionate, successful, brilliant. What are the talents, the gifts, and the qualities about them that you really, really admire and aspire to? And just quickly, just jot them down. Oh, my God, I love the way they blank, blank. I love that they this. They're so amazing at this. And the more that you feel like you're like a fanboy or fangirl of them, the better. And then what is it about their life? Like, what's the message? You know, they, no matter what the odds, they were willing to, to still go for it and, and achieve success. They were abused and they were willing to pull themselves up from the ashes or they fight for women's rights or whatever it is. What is it about their life and their message that really pushes you or really pulls you and inspires you? So just quickly jot down a few notes about them, just getting kind of a snapshot of who they are for you. So that's great. So now understand that what you've just described is not a picture of them. Mm -hmm. The way life works is that whatever pushes you or pulls you is a projection of your unintegrated power. As you're growing up and developing, you are available to everything, but as you have experiences, you say, I am this, I am not that. The all of the I am's become your ego or your identity. The I am nots become your shadow. That energy doesn't go anywhere. It just gets repressed or projected. The, the I am is what you project to the world. The I am not is what the, the world projects back to you. And the I am not can be both dark and light shadow, meaning I'm not greedy, I'm not selfish, I'm not bad. Mm -hmm. But it can also be, and very often is, I'm not talented, I'm not beautiful, I'm not worthy, I'm not creative, etc. So now you've got this entire unintegrated, unclaimed part of yourself. And it gets projected as the people and situations that hold luminosity and attraction and great appeal to you, particularly the ones that you just think are phenomenal, amazing, wish you could know them, meet them, be like them. This is you, folks. This is you. This is your destiny, your greatness, your uniqueness. Now, if you take that list of qualities and attributes and you put your name at the top and you say, I, Michael, am, mm -hmm. and then the best you can, read off those qualities you know, I, Michael, am a powerful, conscious, brilliant expression of love and light that is able to pull myself out of any situation, no matter where I came from, and stand for truth and be a stand for other people. And I'm a brilliant speaker, teacher, author, whatever. That description of you is what I call your soul bio. That's, that's a biography of your emerging potential. Now, the next piece I would ask you, and this is you, and I know for some of you, you're feeling that electricity, but understand, you could not resonate with that if it wasn't in you. Just like if we strike a violin on stage and amplify it to the orchestra pit, all the other violins will hum to that very same note. If you remove that string from those violins, you could strike that note all day long and they will not hum. They will not resonate. So you only resonate with these people because you're seeing you and you've just projected it because, you have, because you've had experiences that said you're not that. So you begin to reclaim that. 
And then if you ask, if I could be that person in the world and be it in any way that I wanted and make any contribution I wanted and I would be successful, I would be loved, and I would be brilliant, how would I want to show up? Who would I want to be? What would I want to do? And how would I want to contribute? If you answer that now from this point, you're going to start to have more stuff bubbling up. So this is just the first couple of steps to begin to show you we're, we're taking what's already here and little bit by little bit, we're teasing out this, this pattern of, of brilliance that is in you, that is projecting clues all around you, including your deep desire because your desire comes from a root that means of the sire or of the father or of the creative principle, also from the heavens. Mm -hmm. So those burning desires aren't a sign of what's outside of you that you need to go get. It's a sign of what's inside of you that's trying to get out. So when you put that together with this soul bio and, and answer that question, you're going to start to put some pieces together. Now, you may not have the whole picture, but this gonna, is you, you, this, this is, is you. This is going to mess with people's minds in the most beautiful way because when we go law of attraction, the secret, any of that stuff, that is so, I don't know, small potatoes compared mm. to what you just expressed because that's thinking inside the fishbowl. You just shattered yeah. some fishbowls here. Right. <laughs> as long as if we, 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 replace, we supplant the fish back into the ocean or the rivers, <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> I don't want them flopping around. I don't want you guys flopping around out of water and gasping for air. Um, jump into this stream of love and light that we got flowing here out of your fishbowl and you'll be good to go. Well, we're in this giant, beautiful, blue spinning globe. <laughs> Mostly water, so. <laughs> Woohoo! So, yeah. okay. So, we. So, that's we've... vision. That's stage one. Okay. You have to know what's emerging because if you don't know where you're going, as we talked about before, if you don't know where you're going, every road will get you there. So, you'll be lost. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to have all the details. It just means you have to begin to tune in to what's broadcasting, to what's speaking to you, and begin to describe it. Because once you know, have some sense of it, now we can start building on that. We can start cultivating the ripe and ready conditions for its emergence. Just like if you don't know what seed is under the ground there, you may not know how to feed it, how much to feed it, what kind of water, how much light, and you might drown it or you might dry it up. So you got to know what the characteristics of the seed that's trying to emerge in you so that you can start to cultivate the conditions inside and out for its full emergence. So we, we get to the next step, which is we understand what the start to understand what the seed is. Um, how do we then get the conditions for that seed to begin to grow or the <laughs> congruent conditions? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, um, and it's really everything, guys. One of the biggest problems is that we might be having a vision for our life, we might be doing affirmations or prayers or vision boards or whatever to be abundant. But then if we really, if somebody was to come in and secretly do a report on our life mm -hmm. and describe the kind of person we are, they would not say that we're a person of great abundance or that we're a person of great power and faith and confidence. They would say, oh yeah, that's a person who's afraid of not having enough, afraid of losing their job, afraid of the economy. So our life is not congruent. And, and so that, that doesn't allow that seed to grow. And, and many times it allows it to, um, for that ground to go fallow. So the first thing is, let's just say your vision is you're a, you know, a, a successful entrepreneur building a conscious business that helps single mothers you know, to thrive in their business and raise conscious children or something. I'm just saying. Awesome. Something. Awesome. <laughs> Good vision, hey? Um, so now you begin to use some of the tools you understand, like visualization. And you would visualize, mm -hmm. but you're not visualizing to make something happen. You're visualizing to get in touch with the vibration, the frequency of the vision. Because your visualization might be wrong. You know, if a caterpillar tried to visualize its greatest future, it would just imagine a better caterpillar life. You know, better caterpillar <laughs> body, better caterpillar job, you know, king of the caterpillars. The problem is its destiny is to grow wings and become a butterfly. And all those caterpillar ideas will become moot and will become irrelevant. So we don't want to be fixated over our vision because whatever vision we come up with is often going to be outdated. Guys, as a, as, a brief, as a brief jump in here, 
Yeah, Last sure. year, I was making a mindful running training program, mindfulness and running together, best-selling author in, in running and coaching, all these other things. And it was fantastic, and it felt off. And I did a lot of this work myself. You, you man, this would have uh, shortcutted the process, having your book. <laughs> but um, I found myself behind the mic, the mic now. We've got one of the top 10 self-help shows in the world. I had absolutely no idea this is what I would be doing and it feels awesome it is much more than I possibly my my puny little and and I love my mind but I mean puny as in I was in the fishbowl I could not have imagined this absolutely absolutely your destiny is beyond your imagination for all of us for everybody absolutely because your imagination can only rearrange what is already known. That's why you'll often see science fiction in the future. We've got more advanced uh, lasers and jet speeds and all that stuff, but, um, but the people are still struggling with all the same stuff. Your, your imagination is going to reconfigure what is known in the, in the collective database, but who you really are and what's trying to emerge has never happened before. It's unprecedented. That doesn't mean it's going to look like nobody can recognize you. It's just, it's unprecedented. So if you merely, so that's why I came up with a, what I call imagination Mm 2.0 or emergination, which is really, (laughs) which is really the imagination of the soul, not Mm -hmm. the imagination of the mind. And so, because the mind is a set of programs and, um, and it's protective programs. Protective programs. Yeah. And it's good because it allows us to operate a lot of stuff autonomously and subjectively and not have to think about beating our heart and not have to think about driving our cars and certain things. And it allows us to be more present actually to what's emerging in the moment instead of having to manage a billion processes. But we have to be using the mind instead of the mind using us. Just like we use our computers, we don't let our computers determine what we do in our life. But that's what happens when we don't have, we don't have um, dominion over our mind. But, but so yeah, so your vision is bigger than you can imagine. It's better than you can imagine. It's actually infinite. And, um, but so you have to begin to have a practice that opens you up to that. But in the meantime, you can use your best case scenario. Mm -hmm. If all you can come up with that really turns you on, because that's a key that really inspires you and turns you on is a million dollars in a mansion and a Ferrari and a beautiful woman on your arm or man or two men, whatever, um, you know, in Chippendale's costumes. If that would, if that's what, if that's honestly what turns you on right now, there's no judgment. Use that. But what's important from the emergence process is not so much the picture, but the vibration. Because if that makes you feel powerful and joyful and expanded and inspired, that vibration is right. That's you the could woo-hoo. never. <laughs> that's the woohoo, and that's the real you. You can never go wrong with that vibration, even though you might right now be associating it to mansions and millions and all of that. And that may be what unfolds. What matters is the vibrational frequency because that's real. You can take that to the bank. And so you use the visualization to activate what I call the visionary vibration. And then you can do that as a process, you know, what I call the VVR process where you visualize you increase the vibration, you fill your body with it, and then you start radiating it to everybody and everything in your life, and then you start radiating it to the planet, because the law of circulation is that you cannot give what you don't have. So you have to first activate it within yourself, but then you cannot keep what you don't give away. So you have to share it and shine it. Oh, I love it. And then finally, you can't sustain what you don't receive. So it's one circuit. It's one full breath cycle. So you you can use visualization to start activating the visionary vibration Mm -hmm. and then start generating it, circulating it, circulating it, circulating it. You generate a new morphic field in your life that is vibrationally attuned. So remember the radio analogy. You are now becoming a vibrational attunement to the station where your music is already playing, where that beat of abundance, symphony of success is already playing and now you become a candidate for breakthroughs, insights, revelations, guidance, direction, all of those wonderful things, because they're all playing on that station, you know, station K R I C H, K Rich, 
you know, whereas the life you've got now may have been through survival and coping tuned into station K-L-A-C-K, K -L -A -C -K, be, be the tuning fork. <laughs> exactly. So that's the first piece in creating congruence. The next piece is once you've got that vibration, now you want to articulate what are the qualities of that vibration. Mm -hmm. So you articulate and identify, you know, the feeling qualities such as love, joy, peace, et cetera, right? Now you take, let's just say we take joy. Now you break it down into what I call the lift practice, which stands for living in the feeling tone, lift. Now you say take the quality of joy and you're going to look at people, places, objects, and activities. Mm -hmm. So people, places, objects, and activities that make you feel or activate that quality of joy. So strip away anything that doesn't activate that and go for this with everything you got. Yeah, so you, that, that's part two. So you jumped ahead, but yeah. Because so <laughs> that's, that's always oftentimes a little bit harder for people is to get rid of the things that don't activate it because they're often activating toxic chemicals that they become addicted to. Mm -hmm. you know. And so like looking at our phone 100 times a day activates adrenal glands and norepinephrine and all these things that we've actually become addicted to. And um, it's hard to get off that crack. And so, um, so first we want to start by putting some more things into our life that are creating tonic chemicals that are, that are actually creating new addiction for things that are actually supporting us. But you look at the people, places, objects, and activities. So what that means is people that you used to be with, that you sometimes are but don't do it as much as you want, or that you've wanted to but have made excuses why you can't. And that could be people live. Mm -hmm. That could be people virtually, like listening to an audio, watching a video, reading a book on the phone. <clears throat> so you begin to identify, when I'm spending time in the presence of this person or these people, I feel that quality more. So you make a list. Then you look at the places. The places where you activate it. So it could be a place within your home, Looking, sitting in that chair, looking out at the, you know, the nature, could be other environments, sitting at Starbucks, even in the noise, it makes you feel alive. If aliveness is one of your qualities, maybe you feel alive, or it could be out in nature. So there's places. And again, you'll notice they're, they're not places or people or things you're already doing all the time. You're looking for those ones that you know you want to, but you make reasons why you can't, or you used to, and somehow along the line, you stopped. And... Um, and then you find the, the activities. So what are the activities? Dancing, singing, writing, creating, playing, golfing, hiking, whatever it is. There are things you want to be doing more of and you ex have excuses why you can't. And, um, and then finally, objects. These are objects of the sense. Pictures, paintings, photos, trinkets, statues, or smells, sounds, um, you know, colors. You know, the, the sound of the chimes makes you feel peace. The smell of fresh baked bread makes you feel peace. I used to so call it creating your Zen zone. Beautiful. That's exactly. <laughs> so you're, you're finding these things. Now you begin to incrementally, don't go crazy, but you start to now design into your life again more of the people, places, things, and activities that are congruent with that quality. That's just one of the qualities, right? Now, when you put all of these together into one situation, mm -hmm. so let's say you love to hike, you love to be with Sue, you love to, you know, be um, eating this particular kind of thing, you love, uh, you know, whatever, that's, put all these pieces together, and so it's hiking with Sue in this particular area, that's called a super condition. And if you look at your life in those moments when you were totally lit up, you'll identify that you're in a super condition. You're actually with the people, in the pl types of places, doing the kind of things, and surrounded by the kind of sense objects that are all congruent with your emerging potential. And, and children do this effortlessly and automatically until we condition them out of it. And then they learn to design a life by default instead of by design. And we're taking that power back and learning to redesign our life that is a, a match for our soul. And then our life starts to become more effortless, more graceful, more miraculous. And that oak of our being starts to naturally emerge. Now you and said, then, and then the kids uh, jumping in real briefly, and then yeah. the kids 
see us doing this, and they've got a positive model exactly. rather than the neurosis model which they were being put into. Exactly, and we stop training them out of their natural ability to grow up and design lives that match their soul's emerging potential. Because they do it, you know, the kid knows they don't want to be held by Uncle Joe, and mommy or daddy says, come on, stop being so rude and let Uncle Joe hold you. And the kid goes, oh, I guess I got to let this crazy guy hold me and it's not right. Or the kid loves to just draw all day long mm -hmm. because that's an emerging talent that's developing. And the mom's like, you got to get outside. Stop with all that nonsensical drawing. And again, the child gets a message that says, something's wrong with my own, my own guidance system and I need to change so that I, I can be safe and be loved. And little bit by little bit, we lose that connection. So we're reclaiming that and designing a life. Now you said part two, which is then you got to look at the people, places, activities, and objects that are not congruent with your emerging vision. And you have to begin engineering those out of your life. And where you can't, mm -hmm. like you're at a job that you just can't quit today or tomorrow or this week, um, you, you learn how to activate more of this emerging you and bring it into that environment. And I talk about that in the book and my own story of doing that um, when I was at a job that I hated and how I turned it into the job of my dreams. And ultimately, I became such a large space of energy and, and excellence, it couldn't contain me. And I was fired three times. <laughs> and I finally stayed fired. And within a month, I got hired. And I went from making $50 a day to 1000 a day. I went from waiting tables in a three-star restaurant to being wined and dined in five-star restaurants. Mm -hmm. I went from hoping and dreaming of giving my gifts to being paid really, really well to do so. And that didn't happen in my future. It happened on that job as a waiter. As I like to say, I wrote, I wrote an article once, how I stopped waiting and started serving. And I love so, it. So, that's, so you can do that. It's beyond the scope of this call to show you all the steps to that, but it's in my book. Um, but this is how you start to create a life by design, not by default, that is congruent with this emerging vision, and, and you start to get momentum. And that's what we're all looking for. Uncle Mo, the mighty Mo. Oh, I'm we, glad you said that. I call him King Mo. <laughs> King Mo we all gotta hail get, King Mo. Yeah, because without it, we can't break out of the gravity of the inertial patterns that are, that are basically keeping our life in, intact the way it is. We've got a gravitational pull in our existing life that's keeping everything on the ground and mentally, emotionally, and physically, even if it's not a good life or it's not a life we enjoy, um, it's being held in place. So to bust out of that, you need momentum, like a rocket ship. You know, like an airplane needs liftoff speed, a rocket ship, ship needs a certain thrust capacity. You need to create momentum in your life or you'll just get getting pulled back. That's why the average person doesn't live 70 to 90 years. They live the same year 70 to 90 times. You know, they change their locations, jobs, cereals, partners, underwear, hopefully. Um, but the story stays the same. Mm -hmm. And um, this is how you change the story and how you get momentum. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. This is an awesome, awesome start. I'm going to recommend everybody to go out and get the book and really to dive into it. Um, and the book is Emergence, just in case people were wondering. And I'll, I'll show it here if you're watching on YouTube. It is Emergence. Oh, sweet, um, sweet. And where can people go to find the book and to find more? Because we can keep going uh, sure. for hour and hour after this. I, I can yeah. see why JD said you're such an amazing guest. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, the, you, you can get the book at, you know, it's either bookstores or obviously Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And if you get the book, um, go over to... Um, a website, getemergencebook.com. That's all one word, G-E-T-E-M-E-R-G-E-N-C-E book.com. And I'm going to give you like, I think it's about $1,700 in bonuses, including support and um, an additional program to support you getting the most out of this book. And um, you can also just go to my site, DerekRydell.com, D-E-R-E-K-R-Y-D-A-L-L, Dot com, and um, there's additional free um, audio downloads and things to support your process of emergence. And uh, we'll have a link to all of that as well through InspireNationShow.com so we can help get them over there. 
So awesome. if you go to inspirenationshow.com. Well, any last words of wisdom? You've shared so much. Thank you. You know, you're welcome. It's my, as you can tell, it's my joy. Um, you know, this is a super condition for me. I'm, with, <laughs> I'm, I'm hanging out with my peeps. I'm surrounded by awesome ideas and information. I'm doing what I love. Um, so, yeah, I would say if there's, you know, to get in touch with, to know that there's a, there's, that what we're talking about here is actually true. It's not just a nice idea. It's not just a clever concept. But if you get nothing from this, please know that there's nothing wrong with you, that you're not broken, you're not damaged, you're not diminished. Nothing you've been through has taken one thing away from you, and nobody ever can. But also, the world can never add anything to you. No amount of letters behind your name or dollars in your bank or any external validation can add to you. You're already it. You already have it all. And if you just will begin to honor that and just ask yourself, Make it an exercise every day for the next seven days or if you really want to anchor it, the next 21 or 66 days. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, if this was really true about me, if I was really this deeply supported by life, if life really was for me and everything I could ever want was in me, how would I show up today? How would I show up tonight when I come home to my wife and kids? How would I show up tomorrow when I show up at the office? Who would I be? How would I start to shine? What might I take a chance on and take a step out on? What might I start? What might I finish? If this was true about me, because it is, and if you'll just ask that question and make it a practice to start just picking something to do every day, you will start to create the congruent conditions and design a life that supports the brilliant genius that's trying to emerge in you. And just know that I'm supporting you. I hope I can connect with you all again and personally and Stay inspired. Woohoo! Yes. <laughs> be a rock. Well, you will be a rock star. Yes. So, one last question I have for you I ask all of our guests, which is what brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> oh, man. Gosh. Well, I would say the first thing that comes, the first two things that come to my mind are my children mm -hmm. and my connection to spirit, to truth, to love. That's my foundation, you know, God and children. And the, the, the other thing is creation. So if I've got my connection to God, my connection to my family, and I'm creating, I'm on fire, I'm inspired, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm definitely woohooing. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. We'll do a brief meditation afterwards that everybody can catch on Inspire Nation show as well. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well. Have fun. Be the oak tree you were always meant to be. <laughs> and shine bright. Woohoo! Take Thank care, you. everyone. Thank you, man. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good work, man. Good work. I've interviewed a lot of guests. A lot of guests. You're the rock star. Mm. Thank you, my brother. Oh. Takes wow. one to know one, man. I have a list here. I do my homework. I really... And I can tell when somebody's... And, 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 and this isn't just lip service. I can tell when somebody is plugged in because the list will come out without me saying it mm. and you ticked off at least 90 percent of what's on here and the things you didn't tick off they weren't important mm. you went katink 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 wow well i appreciate you bringing that consciousness you know that allows that that cosmic tumbler to click into place <laughs> and, uh, and the flow you know to flow out you know i never let my idea of what should be said get in the way of what 
must be said. Mm -hmm. And um, you were obviously, you obviously were tapped into to know what was supposed to be said. So I always say beforehand, I have no idea, and and that's yeah. it's a ride. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's what makes it fun, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man.